Okay. Okay. Good morning. We are in Perak Chet in Sefer Yeshayahu. Uh, Perak Chet is a continuation, really, of the previous Perak. If you remember from the previous Perak, we had dealt with three, with actually four countries, a little bit of a fifth. There was the north, the northern kingdom, which was governed at the time by Pekach ben Rimaliau. He was going to be assassinated within about a year, and a puppet king was going to be put in his place by Ashur, or Shea ben Elam, who would be the last king of the northern kingdom. So we're right up to the time of the exile of the ten tribes. Pekach ben Rimaliau is in the north. You have Retzin, who is Melech Aram. Ritzin Melech Aram is in the northeast. And then you have a little bit of Mitzrayim, which plays a little bit of a role, not much, in the south, obviously. And the enemy of everyone right now is Ashur, the Assyrian Empire. Now, the Assyrian Empire was posing this massive threat. And what was taking place at this moment was there was an alliance that had been created between the northern kingdom of Israel, Pekach ben Remaliyahu, and Ritzin Melech Haram. And they came into an alliance to try to hold off Ashur. And they wanted also the king of the south, Ahaz, to join with them. This story was taking place initially in the fourth year of Ahaz's reign. And if you remember last week, we had, not two weeks ago, the last parent, we had talked about uh, some symbolism with the birth of a child who is going to be called Immanuel, or Immanuel, as we'll say it as a name when it becomes a name, that that child was going to be the second child of Yeshayahu. There was actually a bit of a debate whether it was Yeshayahu's child or it was going to be Ahaz's child. It's a, there's a little bit of an ambiguity there. If you remember, it was talking about the Alma, the younger woman who was going to have a child that didn't identify specifically. And once you have the, that piece in place, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had, made, had reached out to Yeshayahu and told him, don't let them create and don't force let them force you into creating an alliance, the northern, the southern, and Aram against Ashur, because the northern kingdom's days are numbered. Aram will not be able to hold off. And if you join with them, you're going to be swept away when Ashur is going to come at an attack. At the present in the story, there have been attacks already. The northern kingdom has come south. We're not really sure if they came all the way south or if it was going to be Aram that was going to be joining them. Simple explanation is Aram is in Transjordan, on the, uh, the eastern bank of the Jordan River, and they were headed straight south capturing. And Ashur had gone Der Hayam, had gone by the Mediterranean Sea. Ashur really wasn't that interested at this point in the southern kingdom, in Yehuda. They weren't that interested in what was going on down there, but they were spreading their... Uh, their hold over the Middle East, and with the land of Israel always being a key factor in, in movement between Europe and Asia and Africa. And so we, we always got caught in the middle. It wasn't that the land of Israel was always their focus of, of capturing something. That was last week. This week, Yeshayahu is going to continue to make his appeal to Ahaz via prophecies of not joining in. And there's a number of different ways that we can structure the parak, but the beginning of the parak definitely is talking about what will happen. In other words, the destruction of Aram and Shomron, the idea that there are going to be people who are going to want to depose Ahaz because, because he's refusing initially to join in with this alliance. We're going to see Ahaz ultimately joins in with Ashur. He makes the absolute worst possible choice. And then the idea of those who remain and what's going to happen with those remaining. That's the beginning of the parak. Then we have a number of different prophecies of Yeshayahu to the people themselves. Among them is an interesting turn that takes place around, uh, around Pasuk Ted Zion, where there's a bit of a debate, but where it sounds like, and this is um, Yol Bin Nun and Benny Lau's approach, it sounds like that the Navi is going to retreat, that he's going to see that what he wants to have done is not going to happen. And as a result, he's going to pull back. And he's essence, in essence going to just work with his immediate circle of students and wait for a day when he may have some impact, which he isn't able to have right now.
And that's the Perak. And so the Perak is continuing with these major powers, the North, the Northeast, the further North, the further North and the South, all and how it impacts on Yehuda. Vayomer Hashem Eli. So the beginning of the parak starts very simply that God speaks to Yeshayahu. Yeshayahu reports this. Kach lecha gilayon gadol. Take for yourself a large gilayon. Now, a large gilayon could be a number of different possibilities. Gilayon um, is, could be a large piece of uh, parchment. It could be a tablet itself. In fact, that's one of the explanations of what it is. That it says, Targum Yonatan, it's a luach some kind of tablet, but it's something that you're able to make a pronouncement on. It's almost like one of the Pashkvilim that you have in Israel today. Imagine for a moment a large piece of paper, take it. Now, this, the reason why it's called the Gilayon, the Dat Mikra points out, is it's it's so large and it's Galui Lakol. It's something that everyone could see. And I want you to write on it with Cheret Enosh. Now, Cheret is typically a pen or a marker, or something large in that sense. In this case, Rashi says, I want you to write it in a way that everyone can read it. The Malbim has a fascinating approach of this. The Malbim doesn't say, I want you to write it in a, in a way that everyone can read it. Rather, he says, I want you to draw on it pictures. I want this to be a, a poster board. And I want you to draw pictures, and the pictures should be of the of battle and of spoils of war. I want you to make this whole mural, in essence, and do it like that. The, the Malbim is somewhat uh, to his own opinion on this. In other words, he says, it's a, I want you to write on with a cheret, and I want you to do pictures of enosh, of, of people. Remember, enosh is the earlier form of the word ish, just like we have Anashim, or in modern Hebrew, you have the word ish, and in the Yud, there's a dagesh, because that's the remaining nun that fell when we went from Hebrew, from some of the other Semitic languages to Hebrew. So I want you to do this with the cheret anosh, and the cheret anosh, again, is something that everyone should be able to see. And what I want, what do I want to have in? Uchtov alav b'cheret anosh, and I want you to write the following on the cheret anosh. Lemaher shalal chashbaz. Now, lemaher shalal Baz sounds like a redundant piece. It's Lemaher Shalal. The spoils will come quickly or will occur quickly. Chash Baz, Chash again is it quickly will come the um also the spoils of war. That in essence, that what Rashi says that this is a hint towards that quickly, that Ashur is going to come quickly, Ashur is going to attack, Ashur is going to make sure that these two. Um, monarchies who are trying to get you into an alliance, they're going to fall. Now, that is, according to Rashi, Rashi is actually talking about, says this is not talking the immediate future. Rashi, Rashi is actually talking that this is going to occur a couple of generations later in the time of Tzitzkiyahu Amelech, when it's actually the Galut, not this moment of danger that exists. However, and according to the Rashi, in fact, what you have here is Lemaher Shalal, that's talking about the northern kingdom. Chash Baz is going to be about the su southern kingdom. He's actually talking about the time, even going all the way to the last king of the south of, of, um, of Tzidkiyahu Amelech. So all of this, Rashi says, is a prophecy of now and a prophecy of the future. The Radak disagrees and takes a simpler approach. The Yeshayahu is talking only in the here and now. He's only talking about the idea of the exile of the Northern Kingdom. It's going to occur quickly. Why the redundancy, says the Radak, for emphasis. We often are redundant for emphasis purposes. We, we do this, and so it's only talking about the North. And I want you to put this on the, the this, char, this chart, this Pashkvil, I want you to put out. Again, according to the Malbim, I want you to draw a mural of this kind of event. According to most of, of the other Meforshim, I just want you to put on this massive piece of paper four words. Now that is, by the way, uh, I, I assume people have seen this sometimes in graphic arts, the most striking kind of poster that you can create has a tremendous amount of white space and just some black words. Jenny, hopefully, will agree with me on that. Okay, uh, there was a there was a la havdil elif havdalot. There was a campaign once about drinking milk, and all it had this big white billboard, all it said in black letters, "Got milk." That was it. It drew your attention, and it had that that effect. La havdil, this is drawing your attention. I want you to tell the people, the, the North are a bunch of goners. 
and that's what's happening. Uh, what's, what's the border between the north and south? The north and south, it's a little bit north of Yerushalayim. Okay. A little north of Yerushalayim. Va'idali edim nemanim. And so Yeshayahu says, I'm, I'm giving on this good witnesses, faithful witnesses, because whenever you have a significant kind of document, you want to give it the shtemple that it's real. It's not some fake news. At Uriah HaKohen, I want to put in place here, Uriah HaKohen, I also want to put it, Zechariah ben Yeverech Yahu. And I want to also put it in Zechariah. Now, ultimately, these two names are names that appear in places in Tanakh. But this piece is something that is actually used later on by Rabbi Akiva. There's that famous Gemara, if you remember, of Rabbi Akiva. It's the end of Makot. Rabbi Akiva laughing when the other Chachamim are crying over the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. And we have two prophecies that he refers to. The prophecy, the first prophecy is the prophecy of destruction. Okay. And that was Uriah ben Shmaya from Kirtna Yarim. This is a prophecy of Yirmiyahu that there's going to be a destruction. And then Zechariah Hanavi, like one of the Treyasaris, Zechariah, he goes ahead and he's in the time, he's also at a later time where he talks about the the what's going to happen, the rebuilding itself. Yeah. No, both are not living, but we'll get to that in a second. So Rashi says that what's happening is this is part of a prophecy in essence, that all of this that is being written is talking about also a future destruction. Remember Rashi says that the latter part is about the destruction of the South and the Beit HaMikdash itself. And these two prophets in the future are going to prophesy. They're going to, in essence, give testimony in the future to it. Yeah. Spanish and Din who are not living. Okay. Ah, so first of all, prophets can talk about things that are going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's called prophecy, right? So the prophecy, in other words, as opposed to, and by the way, just, it's like Hashem said, I'm going to have the opposite matter what I'm saying. Hashem saying, I established to you, Abraham Avinu, that most of is my faith. Right. So what is happening in this? And this is the complicated piece of it. The complicated piece of it is Rabbi Akiva actually uses this in his medrash. He uses psukim, he uses these people, and he seems to imply that all of this is from that time. And so Rashi is taking that midrashic approach, and we have these names over there. Now, the, the Ibn Ezra disagrees. The Ibn Ezra says, listen, Gadol at that time, it's not that Uriah, and it must have been Zechariah, it must have been something else who was a very important person at the time. And what's really happening here is HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling Yeshayahu and Avi, I want you to write this poster. I want you to put these words or these pictures on this poster. I want these two important people who live now to go ahead and sign off on the poster. That's the simple explanation of the Ibn Ezra. He takes it that way. Rav Carmel, interesting, wants to suggest that since we don't find Zechariah elsewhere, or Zechariah, the Zechariah we know is Zechariah Navi, that maybe it's possible that Zechariah, who was going to be living later, was already the Doresh Elohim in the, uh, in the time that there was a Zechariah, and this was a Zechariah that we knew. He's actually mentioned by the time of Uziyahu, in Divrei Amin Bet, Perek Chavav, Pasukei, or also Achas's father-in-law's name was Zechariah. So Rav Kermit is saying, you know, what's pushing Rashi, because we don't know of this, who the Zechariah is, what's pushing Rashi to say it's Zechariah Navi and that all of this is talking about having prophets, having witnesses of people who aren't around yet, maybe these people are around and maybe we really do know of a Zechariah already. And if we know of a Zechariah, Okay, so maybe that's the Zechariah, maybe that's the way to solve the problem of who is this mysterious Zechariah who's so important to sign off on a document, yeah. Is it also possible that this is making a from generation to generation? 100%. So Zechariah, then Yivarech Yahu has a child who names Yivarech Yahu, and then that Yivarech Yahu names a child. 
and yeah. entirely possible. And that's basically, you know, where the even Ezra is, is going for that these names were used. Okay. What the problem with just taking even Ezra saying these were used, they must have been important people, is we haven't heard of these important people. So Rav Carmel actually suggests who these important people were. Now, on the other hand, the Radak takes a different approach entirely. The Radak says, no, these two people were already around. And when they prophesied later on, they were old men. And so, okay, it's possible that they were the same people. It's a, it's a little bit stretching it. So you have from Rashi that it's definitively talking about people who are going to sign off on this poster who live in a later period. The Radak says, well, they may have already been alive now. The Ibn Ezra, who says, no, these are people from this period. We're not, and Zechariah, who we really don't know who he is, at least, at least or we know he's a Kohen. But the Zechariah, we don't know who he is. Okay, there must have been somebody named him. Zechariah was important. And then Rav Carmel kind of pick, picks in on that Ibn Ezra piece and say, hey, you know, we do have two Zechariahs. One is the Doresh Elohim. Okay, he was like a spiritual leader at that time. And another is the father-in-law of Achaz. Now, by the way, you just take it for a moment and you think about, I'm putting up a poster that says Achaz, what you're about to do is stupid. Excuse me. Okay, it's gonna, gonna lead to failure. And who's gonna sign off on the poster? The father-in-law. Okay, that's a pretty powerful piece. But all of that happens and the poster is going to be created. He was told to create the poster. He was told to have the sign-offs on it. And then it says, and I now, Yeshaya was reporting, I had relations with the prophetess. Now, who's the prophetess? Well, Rashi says simply, it's, he's talking about he, he had relations with his wife. Why is she called the prophetess? There's a couple of different possibilities. One simple possibility is that the wife, the Radak and Ibn Ezra say this, the wife of a prophet is called a prophetess. Okay, you have a, a rabbi and a rabbinson, you have a navi and a naviyah. That's a simple explanation. However, the Mahari of what, and I, in Hebrew, it's Mibil Gansi, in, it's, in French, it's B E A U. G E N C Y, Boisjense, I think. Okay, Boisjense? B E A U, Bo, Jense, it's a G E N C Y. Okay, Bo Jense, that's where he was from. He was from France, and the way we wrote it out over the years, mispronounced it a little bit like we do often. He says, actually, he might have, she might have been his wife. You know, it seems to be that she was Yeshayahu's wife, but she may have also been a real prophet. Okay, so it's the title. Okay, but we're leaving the title. And she's going to have a child. And Hashem says to Yeshayahu, Okay, call him by this name. Now, um, it's probably, they called him probably as a nickname. It's a joke. Mori, Maher. Okay, now, the reality of it is, okay, this is the second time where we're using this child. Now, true, we had Shar Yashuv. And Shari Yashu, we used a couple of Prakim ago talking about the Pleita, people are going to do Tshuva and come back. This is the second time, though, in a very brief period of time, that we're talking about a child being born. Because all of this is happening at the same time. This is a Z Vav and I'm sorry, Zion and Chet, these two Prakim, are really one story. And so, how is it possible that this one woman, if we say that this woman had a child, Emmanuel, and now she's going to have another child, how does it work in such a short period of time? So Rashi takes the approach, as do many of them before she, that we're not talking. This is all taking place in one year, and it must be that child number two, Emmanuel, must have been the son of Ahaz, and not the son of Yeshayahu, because how can you have two children born within a year? doesn't work that way. So if you're talking about pregnancy and birth, all within that fourth year of Ahaz. There is, however, the Malbim takes a little bit of a different approach. And the Malbim says the approach, well, it could be that the first child was already when, when the prophecy came that his mother may have been in the ninth month already, in which case he was born in the beginning of the year. And the other child could be born later in that same year. You don't have to automatically say there are different parents that we're talking about of these children. The Mahari Kras says know that actually that not all of this took place at the same time. That actually what happens is the Maher, Maher Shalal um, 
Chashbaz, that he's born later, that the first son, Emmanuel, is born now, and the, la the later on it's, it is the next one called. Now, interestingly, when you talk about these names, these names could be understood in two different ways. We're understanding it because of the initial prophecy. The initial prophecy is that you need to tell Achaz that any kind of alliances with the Northern Kingdom or with Aram are doomed because they're going to be gone very quickly. Maher Shalal Chashbaz. They're going to be despoiled by Ashur. And however, says the Dat Mikra, if you look at that name out of context, out of context, it's a, actually not that it's a, not that it's a name that rolls off your tongue, but it's a name that says you're going to be the child. You're going to be a child of power who's going to be able to be victorious over others in a quick in a quick fashion. So it's not that that this name is a horrific name to give a child. In this context, it's a name that tells you more than than just. This is a mazel a name for the kid. This is telling you that, hey, one more tangible sign, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling Yeshayahu to create, his three sons all have names. If we say that they're all three his, his three sons all have names that have meaning. There is a third approach within Chazal, and the third approach within Chazal says that actually Emmanuel's name was changed to Maher, Chash, uh, Maher Shalal Chashbaz, that originally it was supposed to be one name and it would be changed to another that really only talking about two sons. All of that is interesting, but not necessary for the Pshat. The Pshat says, I want you to create another sign. Because by the time this child knows how to say mommy and daddy, what's going to end up happening is the king of Assyria is going to have this victorious march going before him. There's going to be a victorious march with all of the spoils of both the Northern Kingdom and Aram paraded through the capital. And this is going to happen. So it's all going to happen very quickly. And if you remember what does happen very quickly is within this year, Pekach ben Remaliao is assassinated. Hoshea ben Elam is put in as the puppet king of Assyria in the Northern Kingdom. Assyria does come and infiltrates more into the land. Those kinds of things happen. And this is a prophecy saying that this is what's happening. By Yosef Hashem Daberilai Odlemo. Now God goes back and speaks one more time to the people. And now when he's talking about it, is he's going to be addressing the threats that the people in the southern kingdom feel from Ashur, threats that are motivating them to actually split into two camps. There's a camp that that's really on Yeshayahu's side, saying, hold back. And there's a camp that says you got to make an alliance. And so there, and those who say you have to make an alliance are willing to depose the king. And when they depose the king, if you remember, the difference between the kings of the north and the kings of the south is not that one group was righteous and one group was evil. We find both. But the kings of the south were all from the Davidic line. They were Malchut Bet David. The kings, uh, the kings of the south were all Malchut Bet David. The kings of the north starting with Yeravam, were other pretenders to the throne. And what happened was there was a series of coups, and then you would have a, a new dynasty for a few generations, and another coup, and a new dynasty, and another coup. There was always this upheaval. Because once a coup can occur, you open a door that you can't close anymore. And so part of what's happening here is Yeshayahu's plea to the people not just don't make an alliance with Ashur because it's bad for us, but or and don't make an alliance with the North or with Aram because they're, they're, theirs is a failed approach, but also don't depose this king. Because once you depose someone from Malchut Beit David, this is going to be a cycle that you'll never be able to survive. And so all of that is happening in this next section. Yosef, <laughs> Uh, the north were the ten tribes, but, and, and, and but they're all part. They're all part of the Jewish people, but they were fighting one one after the next. By Yosef Hashem the Beri Lai Od Lemor, and so Yeshaya reports he had another Nebuah. Yan Ki Maas Ha'Amad Zed Mea Shiloach. Behold, because the Jewish people have now um, despised 
the waters of the Shiloach. Now we know where the Mei Shiloach are. When you go to Ir David, you go down to the bottom of by Silwan, you there's the pools right down there, Chizkiyahu Melech, all that, all that's the Mea Shiloach down there. The Mea Shiloach is an important place. It's from where the Gihon flows, but it's also the place that in the time of David Melech, actually in the time of Shlomo, was the place where kings were anointed. Shlomo was anointed at the Mea Shiloach. The Mea Shiloach, if you go there, is not a raging river. It is a very calm source of water. And that was the source of water. And he says, because you have despised at Mea Shiloh, Shiloach, because you've despised, and Rashi explains it, that despised the, the monarchy of Malchut Beit David. Mea Shiloach represents Malchut Beit David. That's where they were anointed. And it also represents the type of monarchy, which was a monarchy that sought peace and, you know, and, and tranquility, just like those waters were. Halchim La'at, because that's what the kind of waters are. They go slowly. There, umaso said Ratzin, uven rimaliyahu, and instead, what you're doing is you're this masos. There's a frenzy towards you're you're running, you're choosing the uh, to go and to align yourselves with those two kingdoms, Pekach ben Rimaliyahu and Ratzin. When we refer to Pekach ben Rimaliyahu as just ben Rimaliyahu, it is meant to be insulting. Okay, you don't call a person by the name; you just call them by the last. Nowadays, it's all different. But once upon a time, if you didn't refer to a person by a first name or with a title and a, and a last name, it was considered to be a, a major insult. Definitely in the times of Tanakh. So since you're doing, you're choosing to go with them, says Hashem through Yeshayahu. Therefore, you don't want that kind of water. I'm going to bring against you this massive water, this powerful river with great amounts of water, what's the powerful river? That powerful river is the Euphrates. Why the Euphrates? The Euphrates are where Assyria is. You don't want Malchut David. You want to go ahead and you're thinking of Assyria. You're going to see what it's like there. Et Melech Hashur vet Kol Kvodo. The king of Assyria, all of his power, his honor. Ve'ala al kol afikav, ve'ala al kol gedotav. And that water is going to go as high as it can, and it's going to overflow its banks. Ve'chalaf biyuda, shetaf va'avar. And it is going to go through, it's going to, uh, shetaf um, is, uh, what this good word. More no, it's it's like a very strong flood. flood. It's even more than flood. It's it's raging waters. Okay, it's going to rage and it's going to go back. Now, interestingly, Shatav says the Shatav says Rashi, it's bechoska. It's it's with power. It's going to overflow. Ad savar yagia. It's going to reach up to the neck. Now, reaching up to the neck, if you're looking at this idea of prophecy and poet, that's as, as much of a threat as you can possibly get to. Waters go up to your neck. It's the moment before they will destroy you. Interestingly, according to the Radak, why is it up to the neck? It's not going to get the head. What's the head of Yehuda? Is Yerushalayim. It will destroy, but it won't destroy Yerushalayim. Emmanuel. And his wings spread. Now, mutot, mutot can come from the word nitia to spread out. The Radak says the, the, um, the military camps of Ashur are going to be spread out and it's going to fill the entire land of Israel. Rashi says, by the way, a motam, mutam is actually the end of of the wing of a, uh, the end of a wing is called the muta, where those mm -hmm. final, the wing tip, the final feathers, those feathers there. Those final feathers are generally a small portion of the wing is about a 60th of the wing. And what he says, this whole idea is that Sancheirev's army is going to come. It's just going to be one 60th of his army is going to be able to fill up the land of Israel. Meaning you want to know the massive power of Assyria. It's just the wing tip. Is gonna is gonna be enough to, to over overwhelm Eretz Israel, Emmanuel. Nevertheless, says the Abarbanel, Imanu, Kel. We are going. Hakadosh Baruch Hu will save Yerushalayim. It's he's talking specifically. Rashi says at this point to Yehuda, 
He's saying there will be an element of salvation despite this overwhelming massive power of these raging waters of Ashur attacking you. Ro'e Amim. Now, Ro'e Amim, simply Rashi says it's a, an, a it's like Re'im, like friends, the, the alliances of the with the nations, the Chotu. They're going to be broken. In other words, it's as if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying, you want to join with someone else? Hag isn't a hate, but you'll be destroyed. It will break. Everyone should listen. Wherever you're at, listen to what I'm telling you. You can go ahead and strengthen yourself. At Motnav, you can put on your weapons, you can weaponize yourself. Rashi says, actually, I'm going to tell you this, no matter what you do, time after time, you think that you have the power, you don't have the power, it will be broken. And now the famous Pasuk, Utsu too far. Go ahead, make your plans. They'll be too far. Look, la hafer. They'll be they'll be undone. Dabru davar. Then speak whatever you want to talk about. Velo yakum. They won't be. It won't be fulfilled. Ki Manuel. because ultimately Hakadosh Baruch Hu is with us. So you people who are planning all of these things realize they're not going to do anything. You're if you think your alliances are going to be successful, it isn't going to be. Now Yeshayahu is speaking, okay, that he's telling the people, look, this is how HaKadosh Baruch Hu told me to act when I'm a lonely voice versus all of the rest of the people. God spoke to me when this prophecy overpowered me. God held me back. He warned me, says Rashi. Don't go ahead and don't participate in these rebellions. Now, what is this rebellion? The Radak follows his approach as he has throughout the immediate rebellion. He said, don't, he said, Yeshayahu, all these people who have different plans, whether to join with Ashur or to join with Aram and, and Shomron, don't do it. Don't go that way. Don't allow them to overthrow Beit Malchut Beit David, Achaz himself. Rashi goes back to the idea, and Rashi says, wait a second. This is now not immediate. This is actually going to be talking about a later event, and this is with Shevna and Chizkiyahu. Now, if you remember Chizkiyahu HaMelech, we're a little bit later, Chizkiyahu HaMelech was um, was um, was threatened by Ashur. If you recall, there was a siege placed on Yerushalayim, and they were mocking them. Shevna was one of the key players. I produced for you this, this sheet. I'm just going to go over. Okay, the top place just describes who Shevna was. Okay, Shevna is the person who faces off against the Assyrian general Rav Sheka. Rav Sheka is insulting the Jews. If you remember, they ask him to don't speak in Hebrew, okay? They, because he doesn't want to demoralize the people from on top. This is the middle of a siege. In the Gemara, we talk about Shevna, though, in a little bit of a different way than we're familiar with from the Psukim itself. And so if you look at the Gemara Sanhedrin on Chavav, Amar Aleph, okay, my kasher v'shaim shevna hu d'reish b'tlei sar ravavata, chizki avav d'reish b'chad sar ravavata. The Gemara asks very simply, and I'm just going to look at it, what is the source of the halacha, of a halacha about a conspiracy of wicked people? Okay, are they considered part of a group or not? Shevna, okay, he would teach Torah, to 130,000 people, Chizkiah would only teach to 110,000 people. Kiata Sancherev, when Sancherev came, Vitzar Alay di Yerushalayim, and he placed siege over Yerushalayim, Katav Shevna Pitka, Shevna went ahead and he wrote a note, Shada Begira, and he shot it over the wall with his arrow. This note, in other words, he was conspiring with Ashur. And he wrote, Shevna um, Vesiaito, Okay, uh, when it came to the question, Shevna and his people 
they tried to make peace with Sanacherib. Chizkiyahu did not do there. And it says in Tilim, have a kamistape Chizkiyahu. And Chizkiyahu, though, was afraid. Amar dil machas v'shalom netiyada te da kudsha brichu bataruba. Okay, he said, wait a second. I got Shevna who's trying to uh, make peace with the Assyrians under this horrific siege. We don't see this in the text directly, but under this horrific siege, we see Shevna, according to the text, just as like a faithful messenger to Chizkiyahu. We see in this Gemara, the Medrash says Shevna was trying to, to, to make peace with Assyria, to, to end the siege that way, to give in to them, whereas Chizkiyahu was hanging in strong. But Chizkiyahu was afraid. He said, wait a second. He teaches 130,000 people. I only teach 110,000 people. It means he has a greater influence. He says, maybe HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to go to the majority. Came in the Ruba Mimsere, in Hunami Mimsere. And if the majority of the people, the 130,000 people who were followers of Shevna are going to go with the Assyrians, okay, then maybe he goes in and says, I have to also. Along comes Yeshayahu and he tells him, Lo Tomrun Kesher Lechol Asher Yomar HaAmazeh. Kesher, don't. Uh, agree to a conspiracy about with all these people who are saying let's make a conspiracy because a conspiracy when people are trying to conspire for something bad they don't count in terms of what a majority vote is and Shevna went ahead, he tried to make himself a, 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 a grave site, and the Navi said, and the Navi said, get out of here. You don't have a chance to be part of this, this situation. What Rashi says now is this whole idea is actually not a prophecy about now, which the Radak says it is now, and it's easier to understand it, but I couldn't, you can't leave out Rashi when you have a shear. Rashi says this is going to be a prophecy instructing Yeshayahu and Navi how to behave in the future when he has another conspiracy, another group of people who are looking to go ahead and give in to the enemy. So, so is it saying that the 130,000 people count as nothing because they're... A because they're conspiring to evil. Right, they're conspiring for evil. So what he what he says is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to him like this, Lo Tumrun Kesher, don't say, hey, let's go into a... Um, into a conspiracy. Don't conspire with the enemy, ultimately. Okay? But, that the people say, let's conspire. Don't be afraid. Don't be concerned about their strength, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now again, the Ibn Ezra takes the same approach as the Radak. He says, this is all talking about right now. Right now, we're still in the midst of the group of people who want to depose Ahaz, overthrow Ahaz, so that Ashur will be able to come. Yeah. Excuse me, a long-lasting conspiracy. In other words, the seeds of the civil war inside Israel against the king, Ahaz, actually continues into Ahaz's uh, son. Right. So it will continue to later. And you said this is only the fourth year of, of Ahaz. Right. Ahaz, I think, rules maybe like 16 years right. or so. So you don't have a long time. Right. So really the question really is like this. There are two ways of looking at what's happening at Yeshayahu's prophecy. Is Yeshayahu talking just about the immediate issue? The immediate issue is the current conspiracy against Ahaz okay, with the immediate threats of Shomron, Aram, and Ashur. Radak, Ibn Ezra, take that. The Rashi takes a different approach. Rashi takes the long game, like you're talking about. It's not that far off, and it won't be that different of a situation. In essence, according to Rashi, what basically happened was up until that pasuk, up until we get to Yud Aleph, Akhodesh Baruch took care of those of those cons conspiracies, those attempts to overthrow Achaz. Now he's talking the long game. Yeah. But the thing is, I like Rashi's approach, if I may say so, only because conspiracies don't start in a moment they build and so it the seeds of it may be here it could be us, and it continues all the way through to it's the time right now ultimately ultimately there's no downside ever in saying I like Rashi's approach, okay? Because Rashi's Rashi, right? We the the challenge with Rashi here is when Rashi says, "Are we saying this is the pshat or the pshuto shomikra?" Um, Radak and the Ibn Ezra seem to follow more of the pshat approach. Rashi seems to, to be looking at a bigger approach to it. Both of them are correct. 
one of the authorities at either Russia or any of the other proportion of have. Well, so they're, they're working off of their own teachings. They're working off of the Gemaras that talk about it. Here, the, you know, we have a Gemara specifically that uses this pasuk, the, the one I handed out, they use this pasuk to say it's talking about Chizkiyahu's time. Okay, the Radak, said, the Radak would respond most likely and say, you know, that's a Midrash. It is a value. But if I'm looking at a shot level, that's really where the Ibn Ezra was headed also. If I'm looking at a, at a more of a simple textual, contextual meaning, it would seem to be, why am I jumping to a, diff, a future conspiracy? Let's stay with the current one. we got a good conspiracy to deal with right now. And he says, et Hashem tzvakot oto takdishu. So, Kodesh Baruch is telling Yeshayahu, look, God is the one who you should oto takdishu. Okay? You should sanctify him. He's the one that you should only be afraid of God, only be in awe of God, only be only the one Hakodesh Borhu is the one who's going to give you or take away your strength. And it will be for a Mikdash. Fascinating machloket among the Rishonim. According to Rashi, this is the word Mikdash, is like from the word hit kadshula machar, preparation. It isn't a sanctuary, it's a preparation. And he says, okay, that the I that the um what Shevna is going to talk about is going to be something you have to be prepared for, for bad that's going to come out of it. Be prepared. Know about this conspiracy of Shevna. Mikdash like hit kadshu. Okay, Lemachar. Right, hit konanu. The Radak says, no. And that says it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. God will be the Mikdash. He's going to be the place which we're going to seek. He is the place where, where ultimately Malchut Beit David should be, should be protected. The Ibn Ezra says, actually, Vahaya le Mikdash, Vahaya is referring to the king of Ashur. Okay, and he is going to be the place where it's going to be a mikdash, not in the sense of sanctity, but a place where it's going to have safety to it. It's going to be a, a makom mivtsar, a place where you're in a fortified place. The problem with this pasuk ultimately is there's so much in here that doesn't have explanation. We're really not sure what it's talking about. The haya and he will be. Who is the he? Now, I should say the simple one, and that's why Radak says it, it's a the subject of the previous pasuk, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. However, we also see the rest of this pasuk. Ula even negef The stone will, will harm, the, the rock will be a stumbling block. To the two parts of Israel. Now, who are the two parts of Israel? The Ibn Ezra says, ultimately, there's going to be problems both in the north and the south. The Malchut Yisrael and the Malchut Yehuda. Both the north and the south are going to have problems. They're going to have challenges. The north, we know about the exile. The south is going to be, the Ibn Ezra, whether it's now or it's later, of all these battles, ultimately it's not that far off. We're 140 years before the Chorban Bayit itself. It's not that far off. Rashi says, actually, who's going to be the Shnei Batei Yisrael? That's talking about Pekach, Ben Remaliyahu, and Shevna. It's talking about the, the threats that are going to be in place in the north and in the south. Leoshev Yerushalayim. To the, those who live in Yerushalayim, Leoshev Yerushalayim again, that ultimately, Leoshev Yerushalayim, it'll be an entrapment, a trap, a snare to those who live in Yerushalayim. The Chashluvam Rabim, many are going to, to stumble in these conspiracies, in these terrible tragedies, they'll fall, they'll be broken, they will be, um, st they will stumble and they will be captured. So what the Navi is saying is, look, there's going to be continued conspiracies, continued troubles, and the people who are going to get involved in them, they're going to fall. Tzor to Uda Chatom Torah Belimudai. And now comes this fascinating pasuk. Rashi says that what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is ask, asking him to is take all of this information, write it down, bind it up, and teach the people, Belimudai, teach your students this. In other words, all of these things that I've been telling you, 
they're not going to be any good for the public. They're not going to listen to you. So just take these things and and keep them keep them for your people to learn. Basically, tzor in this case is to tie litzor. It's so rare. Okay, uh, litzor is uh, is like a bundle. It's, it says bundle. You know, tie it up. Don't let anyone know about it. Interestingly. This could also be, and this I mentioned in the beginning, where Yoshua bin, where Yoel bin Nun and uh, Benny Lau suggest that what's happening here is a new era for Yeshayahu, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling him, look, you've done your best, you've, you've conveyed the Nebuot, they're not going to work, you're not going to work on this one. So you have to get ready to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu right now as a minority, as a lone voice. And how do you do so? And so the way you do so is you prepare your students, work with the people who will listen to you. Now, to Uda, the difference between Torah and to Uda, to Uda comes from the word edut, right? and in the sense of that this could be both Torah and to Uda, Chazal look at this, the Torah Shebiktav and the Torah Shebalpeh. To Uda might be another way of saying actually what we would refer to as Mesorah nowadays in our, in our world. V'chikiti Hashem, And the Navi says, I am going to wait until Hashem gives me the time, tells me it's time now to go public again. That's the Ibn Ezra's approach. Hamastir panav mi beit Yaakov. I'm waiting for Akodesh Borhu, who is hiding his face. This is Hester Panim. We know about these concepts. Who's hiding his face mi beit Yaakov. Now he's hiding his face from beit Yaakov. Um, Julius Hirsch points out here, beit Yaakov is not beit Yisrael. Why is it not Beit Yaakov and not Beit Yisrael? Because this is going to be a low moment for the Jewish people. This is a moment when the Jews are creating alliances that ultimately will lead to destruction. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu did what he what provided for us, the Navi. The Navi did the best he could. The Navi was rejected. These conspiracies are continuing. And he says right now, you have to wait. V'kiveti lo. And Hashem, we wait for Hashem. Hine anochi v'ayiladim asher natan li Hashem. He says, the Navi says, look, I and my children, which God gave me, we are going to serve as symbols. Now, Rashi says, who are the Yeladim? Okay, the Yeladim, simple explanation. We're talking about Maher Shalal Chashbaz. Okay, who is going to be the symbol of tragedy? Emmanuel, who is the symbol of redemption? Those children will be the symbols. However, Rashi also says that the that these Yiladai could also refer to Yeshayahu's own students, that he and his school will be the ones. They're going to be the symbols for everyone else. And part of it is, if you remember, there is a famous medrash that Ahaz tried to close or closed all the the Bateknesiot and also the Batei Midrashot so the children wouldn't be taught Torah, that that was part of his evil deeds, whereas Yeshayahu is being told now, teach them, but teach them in secret. Teach them to your immediate your immediate audience itself. Now, if they turn to you and they say, start, Seeking out the necromancers. These are forms of Avodah Zarah that rely on prophecies or on uh, supposed prophecies that are done through dead. Now, the problem was with this is at this time, there weren't Ovot and Yudonim in Eretz Israel. This wasn't one of the things. And we know that uh, Shaul HaMelech okay, went to um, um, the, the Endor, the, the the, 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 yeah, she um she he went to this witch and to have the prophecy and there's a whole machlok at exactly what happened when he couldn't get through to Shmuel anymore, okay, but this is a pro- kind of thing of worship of, of idols that did exist at that time. The the medrash says that this pasuk yutet and achaf actually aren't Yishayahu's, that they belong to. The prophet Be'eri, who was Hosea ben Be'eri, Hosea's father, had a prophecy. His prophecy was two psukim long. What do you do with a two psukim long po- po- uh, prophecy that you want to keep? You append it, you attach it to another prophet. And that these two psukim are here. And the reason is, if you look in the next pasuk, in Chaf, it says, it echoes the same words that we had had 
in the uh, in Pasuk Tet Zayin, Sor to Udach Atom Torah. And so it fits in here. Now the prophecy is talking about when you are challenged by others. They're telling you, do avodah zarah, hamet tzafim v'hamahagim. Now these are, this is mocking them. What are these? What do they do when they serve? They, these people, the part of the service, they were chirping, they were moaning, all sorts of sounds they were making. Hello, am el elokav yidrosh. Wait a second. This is. Don't we go ahead and serve our own God? Ba'ad hachayim el ametim, you're suggesting that we should go ahead and seek goodness for the, those who are living through those that had died. In other words, this kind of avodah makes no sense whatsoever. It's silly, and they're mocking it. Litorav lituda, we ultimately, you have to tell them that we seek the Torah and teuda. We won't use this at all because that has no, there's no sunlight to this. There's no future to this. What you're proposing that we should turn to Abu Dazarat to help us doesn't work. So Be'eri's prophecy can also apply at times when the Jewish people are being persecuted, where they start saying, hey, come over to our faith. And we say to them, we stick with our faith. Every nation stays with their own God. We don't go and start seeking out other gods of other nations. This is the last piece of the Nivuah. And this last piece of the Nivuah, we're really not sure who it is referring to. The Ibn Ezra suggests that this is talking about the people who are going to survive. Remember, after Ashur sweeps away in the raging waters, there are going to be people in Yehuda who are still there. Interestingly, from Sanacherib's own documents that we have now uncovered, the Galut itself wasn't that massive. Uh, uh, in the Northern Kingdom, it wasn't that massive. There were about 16,000 people who were carried away into captivity. There were probably a lot of Jews who still stayed in the Northern Kingdom, but they were assimilated into the cultures of Abu Dazara. So it's, it's an interesting piece to think about. But here we're talking, according to Ibn Ezra, about the people in Yehuda who are going to survive what we had referred to before in the previous paragraph is the Sherita Pleta, those remaining people. The other possibility, he says, this is going to talk about um, the army actually of Sancherev, who is going to be who, the invading army. Because after all the destruction is caused, whether you are the people who remain, the indigenous people, or you are the invading army, there's going to be famine and there's going to be suffering. You destroy so much. And so they're going to pass through it with difficulty and with, with hunger. And when a person is going to be hungry, he's going to start cursing out his king because he doesn't have anything. And he's going to turn heavenward. Now, turning heavenward sounds really great. The people who had rejected, who had wanted to make alliances with Ashur, all of a sudden they're going to turn heavenward. But Rashi says it's really nice you're turning heavenward, but too late. The Gzar Din is already in place. The El Eretz Yabit, and then you turn to the earth, and you're going to be turning to what's remaining in the land. Vinet Sarah. All there is is troubles, v'chashecha, and darkness, me'uf tzuka, oppressive weariness, me'uf from the word ayev, v'afela menudach, and uh, he is a, 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 a darkness that in which you are lost. Afela, according to the Malbim, is even darker than darkness. Darkness, according to the Malbim, refers to the absence of sun. Afela refers to the absence of any form of light, of even the stars and the moon. It's going to be absolute um, tragedy. Kilo ma'uf, because ultimately, what we say, what we say here, kilo ma'uf mu'af lasher mutzakla, because he will not be tired. The one who is Mutzak, who is trying to overcome, who is trying to attack, who is trying to besiege, I think is a better word probably. Uh, him, who is the he who won't be tired? This is according to the Radak, 
okay, that this is referring to the Jews. Originally, they're not going to be overwhelmed. Because initially, the initial exile is not so terrible. That initial exile, which takes place in the fourth year of Ahaz, is just the Galil and Eretz Naphtali. Okay, it's part of the northern land that's going to be taking. Hey, where the Naphtali and Zvulun are being taken away. But the last one is going to be overwhelming. It's going to involve two pieces. It's going to have the Derachayam, the sea, and also the Transjordan area, Galil Hagoyim. And it's going to have the ultimate northern kingdom itself. The, the exile of the three tribes, of the ten tribes, occurred in three stages. The first stage is going to happen almost immediately after this prophecy, within that year. That's when Ahaz is deposed, and that's when Naphtali and Zvulun, the northern part, is going to be taken off into captivity. The second one is going to happen in the twelfth year of Ahaz. The twelfth year of Ahaz, at that point, it's going to be the Ever Hayardain. It's going to be when uh, the two and a half tribes in Transjordan are going to be taken out into Galut. And then finally, the final, um, the final um, um, exile is going to occur. And as we know, at the time when all the 10 tribes are taken away, that's Molochim Bet Perik Yud Zion. And that's going to be what's called the Galil Goyim. In other words, the way he ends is that initially, you're going to think that, okay, we got attacked. Some of our people were taken away. We'll, we'll survive. But at the end, the end, it's going to be overwhelming. Now, the Malbim takes a different way of explaining this. And the Malbim says that, no, actually, the way you understand the opening psukim is that ultimately, this Ashur are not going to get tired. They're never going to wear out. So they're first going to do this, then they're going to do this, and then they're going to do this. Don't think that one attack is going to be enough for them. They're going to keep on attacking you. And Yeshayahu was giving that prophecy and, and telling it ultimately to the people. Now, the interesting thing is, how does this fit in with the rest of the parak? Because we said the opening parak was the warning to Ahaz and to the people. Then we dealt with the, consp the conspirators. Then we said, pull back. And then you have these last few psukim. And we're really not sure exactly who this last few psukim are going to be addressed to. Is this being addressed to his students, who he's pulled back with? Or is it being addressed once again to the public? We're not sure. And there is a major machlok at both in terms of how to interpret this and to whom is this talking. Yeah. Just quickly, um, the last few psukim are directed, or back up rather, the Northern Kingdom. But we're talking to Akos in the Southern Kingdom. So what's the encouragement, discouragement? Well, if you remember, originally the whole idea was don't ally yourselves with, with the North. Sure. With, with the North. The first approach, the this North. whole thing is Aram, remember Aram and Shomron. Yeah, right. Don't do it. They're going to be completely destroyed. But the problem, you're right, is it doesn't sound like it's directed to the people of Yehuda. It sounds more like it's directed to the people of the Shomron. So it's so that's what that's the so that, that's what we don't know for sure. That's a machloket among the Meforshim, who the target is. Are we talking? Is he talking about the Aserta Shvatim? Is he talking about Melech Hashur? If he's talking about Melech Hashur, then and he says he doesn't get tired. Melech Hashur and his armies don't get tired. One, two, three. Well, there's going to be a four, so be careful. Okay, that's that's talking to to you. That if he's talking to the northern kingdom, well, he doesn't raise his access to the northern kingdom. So maybe it's that roundabout way that he's talking to the south. And when he talks to the south, what is happening is he's telling them, "Look what's happening there. Don't don't take any risks with them." Okay, we're going to stop here. Next week will be next week is Mother's Day. Are we okay to have a shear? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> The following week, Rav Shechter is going to give shear, and so the, on the twentieth, we twentieth or twenty-first, whatever the, uh, it'll be, the twenty-first, we will have a breakfast and a shear with Rav Shechter will be here, and so we won't we won't have shear at that on that day, but next week we will. The week after we won't. The week after is the day after Shavuos, or is it? Yes, I'm not sure. We'll see. Okay, but next week we definitely are on. Right. Yeah. So the next week would be the day after Shavuos. I'm not really sure. We'll see. Okay, everyone should have a wonderful day.